visit airpatrolnorth.ca. It's time for part two of our incredible story with Herb Carnegie, a true trailblazer who helped pave the way for future Hall of Famers. We're talking with his daughter, Bernice, Joe Tilly's great Canadian sports show, coming up! Welcome back to the program. Herb Carnegie was a native of North York, three-time MVP of the Quebec Senior Hockey League. He was a star with the Quebec Aces, where he won the Lord Alexander Trophy. He won 24 amateur golf titles. He was a two-time Canadian golf champion. He was co-author of A Fly in a Pail of Milk, the Herb Carnegie story, founder of the Future Aces program, doctor of laws at York University, member of numerous halls of fame, I believe it's 13, member of the Order of Ontario, a member of the Order of Canada. And joining us to talk about her father from Toronto, speaker, author, storyteller, co-author of A Fly in a Pail of Milk, The Herb Carnegie Story, co-founder of the Herbert H. Carnegie Future Aces Foundation, winner of the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal, co-founder of the Carnegie Initiative, and chair of the Harmony Movement, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program, Bernice Carnegie. Bernice, welcome back. This is part two of our feature on Herb Carnegie with his daughter, Bernice. Now, we talked about his amazing hockey career, you know, uh, in, in, in length in the first segment. He won the uh, the two Canadian Senior Golf Championships uh, in golf. How proud was he of, of, this, of his golf exploits? My father totally loved the sport. Uh, the challenge. Uh, he even tried to get all of us involved. I can remember being around 18 or 19 when he wanted me to join the club. And uh, I just couldn't see myself out there for five five hours <laughs> hitting the ball around and trying to get it into this little hole. So uh, it, my, it was my younger sister and my brother who ended up uh, being golfers for a short time. Well, my brother still golfs every day. But um, dad was amazing. He took the skills that he learned in hockey and he applied them to golf. And it was all about practicing. And uh, of course, he was a great athlete. His body obviously was uh, attuned to any kind of sport. And I found out that he had won a baseball <laughs> a baseball uh, uh, tournament for for his team when he stepped in to be the hurler they called them hurlers back then right <laughs> i didn't know he i didn't know he could throw a ball <laughs> yeah well he was but a natural he, athlete he could, yeah. he could hit a ball too so he was yeah. he was just he was natural well, that's another one of his titles, right? He won a provincial championship with uh, a father-daughter provincial championship with your sister, Rochelle. He did. He did. So he, now golf is a passion of his. And, you know, the thing about golf, too, is, is uh, you know, you get on the golf course and, and people can't be racking up points when they're in hospital beds and things like that. When he wins a tournament, he wins a tournament because he's had the least, least amount of shots and it's pretty straightforward. Um Let's uh, talk about the end. Uh, the career, end of his career came when he when he developed glaucoma, um, and I am familiar with that because I have glaucoma. But I noticed when reading your book, uh, he wasn't careful about taking the drops. That's what I mean. We do the drops. I do the drops every day. I, I, you know, you know, around that, and perhaps some of it had to do with the fact of my, you know, because I had met your father many years ago. And I did know that he had glaucoma. So when I found out that I had glaucoma, I wanted to make sure I took care of it. But, uh, you know, that was one of the problems is he just kind of lit up on it a little bit, didn't he? Well, you know, glaucoma is sneaky. Mm -hmm. There's no pain. It kind of just mm -hmm. steals your eyesight away while you're not paying attention. And my mother was the wife who she is. I'll use the word nagged <laughs> she yeah. nagged him a lot for a while like take your drops herb take your drops herb and then finally i can remember her saying i'm not your mother i'm your wife so if you choose not to do this 
And what happened is he chose not to be consistent and lost his sight. He may have lost his sight anyway, but he lost it Mm -hmm. sooner than he needed to. And that was sad because he had this, he was an athlete. He did everything and he did everything with a zest and um, he lived life to its fullest. And then it was like he was put in a cocoon. And when he was put in the cocoon, we were put in with him because we had to pick up what he couldn't do. And I suppose that's one of the reasons why I had such a strong relationship with my father. I ended up being the one that took him places, took him to events, took him to schools to speak with kids um, and got him around so that he wasn't housebound. So I had a very close relationship trying to understand how do you help someone? How do you um, be a support to someone who can no longer see? It was, uh, how, I mean, how did he handle that? uh, You know, the the loss of sight, how was, how was he with that? Like, how was he, was he able to be okay with it? Was he able to accept it? Well, you do have to accept What happens to you one way or another? Sometimes it takes longer than others. He had a resistance to wanting to use a white cane for a while, um, but eventually realized that was a friend uh, to him in, in knowing how he could manage a little bit on his own with the cane. It really put my mother in a box because when we did, we went to many events and when we were at these events, my mother said she was confined. She had to stay by his side. Um, She couldn't go off and talk to people and have a little bit of freedom of her own. And uh, I was a little better when that happened. I would um, sit him to Uh, introduce him to somebody who wanted to chat with him. So I was able to walk around and talk to other people, but I was still, you know, it's still very confining. You have to watch, always be on the watch. How are you going to, how are you going to manage this? And so the lesson to be learned there is when you are told you have an issue, you should deal with the issue and deal up front with it because my father did not do that and it made a difference for everybody in our home yeah we have i i I get a visual field test twice a year i go see an oct you know uh for an exam and and it's all that stuff is really important and so if you you know if you got a problem with anything right deal with it if you got you know get if you're a guy get get your prostate checked i mean and so you know if you're if you're a woman you know right you, you know get your the exams for your, for your, for your breasts. Right. So it's just something we should do for self care. But, uh, we're a lot of what we're discussing is from the awesome book, uh, a fly in a pail of milk, the Herb Carnegie story, which, uh, Bernice co-wrote with her father, uh, just finished reading the book. It's awesome. And I want to talk about the future aces program. Uh, here's what your dad had to say about the future aces. A code, not of conduct, but a, a philosophy for behavior. And when I wrote that statement, in my pain and my anger, I smiled. And I smiled because I said, Herb, if you can do that, you're going to be okay in this world. Tell us about that lesson. Well, my father was an amazing speaker. And I heard him many times sharing that story. And he felt it was the key to everything in his life. Because once he had finished hockey, it was starting all over again. He was rebuilding himself, reinventing himself, trying to figure out what was he going to do to support his family. and. Attitude, he said, attitude was everything 
It was the key to everything that he ever did. Because as long as he had a positive attitude, he felt that he could get through anything. So it didn't matter whether it was sport. It didn't matter whether it was his home life or his life with uh, the neighbors or his life at his jobs. It was about what am I going to do? What attitude am I going to bring to, uh, to others so that they will be more accepting of who I am as an individual? And it Future worked. aces. Yes, yes. Future <laughs> aces. Ability, A, ability, action, achieve. C, courage, cooperation, confidence. E, empathy, example, education. And S, service and sportsmanship. Uh, this, the Future Aces program was eventually picked up by school boards. It was really, it became a, 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 a real thing, right? Yes. Um, my father um, had started uh, going to schools in the late 70s. And uh, it was in the uh, early 80s that I joined him at uh, Investors Group. And he would, take time off, he would volunteer his time to go into schools to talk to teachers and talk to students about values and how important it is that no matter how you're being treated, your response about what you're going to do about it is your responsibility. And so it was about empowering. It was about leadership. And he took me with him. So, you know, we'd be in the office and he'd say, well, <clears throat> I, I, have a, I have a school next Wednesday at such and such a time. Do you have an appointment then or do you think you want to come? So <laughs> I went uh, three or four times and I said absolutely nothing. I just followed my father around like a little shadow. And I'm watching him. And by about the fourth time, I totally was smitten. Uh, I say in the book, I got the bug because uh -huh. I could see what he was doing and the impact he was having. And, you know, there are two really important dates in your life, the date you're born and the date you find your purpose. My father's purpose was to help people to open the doors and find the keys to making their life a better life through their behavior and their attitude. And I was fortunate to join him at the same, around the same age as he had finished hockey. I was starting to join him in his future ACEs quest. So that's when my purpose started. And it's just been so rewarding to, to be involved in this project. It's been a game changer for a lot of people. Um, we have a mutual friend, Robin Jones, who's head of Air, Intercare Brampton and Air Patrol North. And I asked Robin about the importance of the Future ACES program reaching his goals in life. I think the blueprint of character building was about, was about people, being around people, knowing that, you know, success, true success comes from when we are helped to others and others can help us. And so it was really finding that um, really secret sauce of being, you know, enjoying life and having people that you enjoy to be around and they enjoy having you around. And, and then you could kind of meet the challenges uh, together and then find your, find your way by having something to, to contribute. I think that was really uh, the important message. We, we all have something to contribute and we just got to find it within ourselves and, and share it with others. Well, the legacy is important because I, I think we get to learn about where we're going by knowing where we came from. So my grandfather mm -hmm. had, had some struggles uh, he had to find his way. He was not accepted. He wanted to join the Canadian Army and 
who was de denied because of the color of his skin. But he persevered and he kept going until he, he was accepted. And then he actually, he excelled. And so there, there's something really great about perseverance and having the character and a strong will to, to do what's right and to know what's right, even when others are not treating you right. Perseverance uh, is a good word to, uh, to describe Herb Carnegie, wasn't it? Oh, just to be around him. Because he always had that beautiful smile and he could just draw you in. And he was one of those rare people that when you spoke to him, there was nothing else important to him but you. And I, I was really, truly blessed to have him and, and, and to really you know, be able to feed off of that kind of energy. And, and it was just a very, um, very important legacy that lives on today. So how many, how many kids do you think your dad spoke to through the years? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we're talking thousands. I mean, by the time I, I um, got part, part way through with him, we were speaking to about 20,000 students a year. And... Um, the, the schools that we were involved with, there at any given time, there would have been about 200 schools a year that were totally engrossed in the project. It was supported by um, many of the school boards in Ontario and by the Ministry of Education. It was one of, considered one of the top three um, character building initiatives in its early years. And um, so I can't go anywhere, <laughs> and I really mean it. I can't go anywhere without running into somebody who was influenced by um, future aces, whether it was at their school, having met um, my father or met me or the presentations that we've been doing. And I still, I still continue to do that. So um, the story never gets old. Because my, I think along with challenges and along with the message that racism is a part of our life that we really wish wasn't there, um, my father had the ability to continue to reinvent who he was and overcome the challenges, to go around it, to go over it, to go through it. And then when he saw the need, it was, let, what can I do about that? How can I change that? How can we do better? So he always had this little something in him. I have binders of letters that he wrote to corporations and schools and school boards and people responding, this is really great. This is really great stuff, um, you know, kind of keep it up. He was asking for their help. A lot of times what would happen is they would kind of take the idea and change the name. <laughs> so he, he was skeptical. He was skeptical a lot of times. Um, even though he continued to share, um, he was skeptical because people saw that it was a worthwhile idea and they took parts of it and they they ad adapted it, adopted it, embraced mm -hmm. it, and then they would not give him credit for it. Right. Stealing it. So, uh, <laughs> well, so you know what? I'm not going to go as far. You know, every good idea, someone takes the idea and they expand on it. That's what our life is about, to, you know, when, when we had a candle, we, we ended up having a light, right? Um, so, in a way, yes, it's stealing if you don't give the person credit. Right. <laughs> it's borrowing if you give the person credit, right? Yeah, yeah. And we all we, we all have to borrow from somewhere, right? Yes, so, we do. Uh, because just credit when credit's due, though, right? Credit when credit's due. Exactly. So your dad was in a Spider-Man comic. Not too many people can say that. Uh, a crime fighter. How cool was it to be uh, in this comic book for your dad? He loved it. He was blind at the time. So it, it's kind of sad that he didn't get to actually see it. 
But we've had the opportunity, the family has had the opportunity to totally enjoy um, the essence of what that means, like being Im immortalized in a comic book. And Marvel is still out there and kids are still interested. And so, you know, uh, when I speak with young people and I say, yeah, my dad was in two, two uh, he's a real life character in two Spider-Man issues. And they kind of go, oh, oh, you know, like, how could that happen? <laughs> well, it, it, it's really fun. That's uh, that's unique. Nobody can say that, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Some people were in episodes of The Simpsons. I think they had, you know, people like Mick Jagger and everything else in episodes mm -hmm. of The Simpsons, but not in Spider-Man comics. There you go. So um, uh, you were speaking, of, you know, talking about, kids talking to kids and and you were also asked out to, uh, to uh, come down to the maple leaf uh ford performance center the last season i believe it was to speak to some uh, kids <laughs> in blue and white uh, let's roll some of that Vic. how are you all good yes my father didn't always get the chances that he hoped for so there was a little hurt in his heart when he finished hockey but he always wanted to do something that was productive and so he created the first hockey school in Canada back in 1955, and he called his hockey school Future Aces. He believed that those young men would be the leaders of tomorrow. You don't always get to hear about the heroes from our black community, but we were there and we are here. And we need your support. We need you to help make this sport more inclusive. Thank you very much. I was a player who played for Carnegie Arena growing up as kids, and uh, I always remember that experience was pretty tremendous. So, anyways, thank you again for uh, coming here and all that you do. I get a hug, right? How cool is that? <laughs> it was more than cool. Um, my, my eldest son, Vaughn, uh, drove me. It was a snowy, snowy time of the year, and uh, he drove me to the uh, training center. And uh, when he went to get the car afterwards and, and I came out and I got in the car, he said, Mom, like hanging around my mother is pretty darn good <laughs> to, to get to go in with me and, uh, and share time with the Marlies and the Toronto Maple Leafs was, uh, was a highlight because I, I don't think it's something that happens very often that outsiders get to, uh, to uh, do that. No, I'm sure it doesn't happen very often. That was that was really cool to see that for sure. Uh, your you know your your dad has influenced so many people through the years, and uh, we had Jerome McGinley and Grant Fuhr on the show a while back. They were grateful for folks like your dad, and of course Willie O'Ree, who helped uh, make it better for them and paved the way for them to to make it to the NHL. Let's hear from them. I also want to acknowledge Grant and the recent inductee, the amazing Willie O'Ree and guys like Claude Vilgrain and Tony McKegney and Herb Carnegie for breaking racial barriers in hockey. And I know it's thanks to guys like Grant and Willie who made me know that my dream of playing the NHL was attainable. When I first broke in, I, like I say, I was lucky that it came in a time where they were starting to put a focus on it, where it wasn't going to be acceptable. And my time in the NHL, I didn't have uh, um, many, many stories. Uh, you know, my teammates treated me very well and, and, uh, um, you know, I know that guys before me didn't have as easy as I had it and, and had more issues. And even still in, in places, there's, there's issues that kids shouldn't have to deal with and there should, you know, racism and, um, but so I, there's still room for improvement and they're still working away at it, but it's a great game. And also a locker room of a hockey locker room is, is made up of, of so many different nationalities from around the world. And it's part of what makes it special. Is that, was that your experience too, Grant? Is that, uh, you know, the game was special in, in, in a lot of ways and, and uh, you know, that you didn't experience. It sounds like you and neither you nor Jerome experienced a lot in terms of, uh, you know, the racial issues. No, I mean, we were pretty fortunate playing, growing up in Canada and playing in Canada where you, you don't see a lot of it. And, the fact that in Edmonton, when I played, we had different nationalities there. We had Czechs, Finns. So it was a diverse locker room. And we were taught right from the beginning that 
it's family. So there's no colors in family. It's just family. And that's the way we were treated. That's the way we treated it. And that's the way we were brought up. So for me, it made it a lot easier. And some of the guys like Willie, Val James, Mike Barson, uh, Bill Riley, guys like that had to go through a much tougher time where I think I was pretty fortunate where I walked in to a great locker room, one, and a really talented locker room. So that's all anybody saw is that we were winning. And being a goalie, you're behind a mask. So that probably helped a little bit as well. So they're talking about the the locker room experience. And, and I think, you know, th- that's where it was kind of like uh, probably where your dad really felt at home, especially probably playing with, you know, Ozzy and, 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 and uh, McIntyre. They, they, you know, they had the, uh, they had some connection there with their, you know, those with each other and the rest of the players. There seemed to be a camaraderie that was good. My father said uh, that the players always treated him well. I, but there was some, um, there was some delineation between uh, sometimes where they could live. So the actual teamwork and uh, the practicing and, and whatnot was fine. But I know when my father lived up in the Timmins area, uh, one of the uh, managers had put together a complex for the players. And my dad and my mom were the only ones not allowed to live there. Mm-hmm. So it, um, <laughs> you know, the, there was stuff that that happened that they that they dealt with. But generally, um, my father felt accepted. And he even said that there were many times that when he was, when they were playing uh, other teams, sometimes the fans on the other team were so excited about the three black guys that were out there that they would get cheered uh, on occasions. Mm-hmm. They'd also get the opposite as well. So, you know, it just depended on where you were and who, who, was, who was in the audience. Yeah, and even even still, when 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 Grant w- w- moved to Buffalo, he was an avid golfer like your dad, and uh, like your dad, he was turned down at one of the golf clubs, uh, one of the private clubs mm-hmm. in, in Buffalo, and that wasn't very long ago. So, obviously, there's still, but it, you know, just from 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 talking to to Jerome and, and Grant, I got the sense that things have seemed to have gotten better in Canada, but as we mentioned before, with with uh, you know, we're hearing from Donovan and yourself, of course, there's still, you know, that, that polite racism still happening. And, uh, you know, I think that the important thing is to, you know, to deal with it on a one-on-one basis as it pops up, right? You know what? Everybody's different. And every, I can't speak for all Black people. I had my own experiences and my experiences were related to my family. And, but I am very much aware of others who have gone through issues that clearly are not necessary. Mm-hmm. And so this is why we have the Carnegie Initiative for Acceptance and Inclusion in Hockey because there still is a problem. And the problem is such that, you know, like if you only have 40 black players in all of the league, (laughs) that's a quota. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's a quota. Why, why in this day and age, um, are there not more? Well, I've been, I've been hearing stories of younger, younger black hockey players who you know, when it came down to the last moment, they got chucked off the team. And uh, I had an incident just uh, not too long ago where three young men on three different teams in uh, one of the GTA uh, communities, all three boys were black and were the last ones not to make it on the team. And then they went to school the next day and and their teammates are going like, I don't know how that happened. You're better than me. You're better than me. Mm -hmm. So it's not the boys themselves. It's not always the kids. 
but those who are running the system are not always being fair. And it happened to my granddaughter. She played hockey for 18 years and she was let go on a team where she shouldn't have been. And years later, after she finished university, or, um, well, she's still in university, but partway through her university, the coach that let her go actually saw her and apologized. Wow. He knew he knew he was wrong, but he's telling her, you know, five years later, I let you go. I shouldn't have, you know, and um, but at the time it happened to her, I can remember the emotion she went through and what it meant to her. It was demeaning because all of the parents knew she wasn't the one who should have been let go. I want to ask you more. Tell us more about the Carnegie Initiative and uh, what exactly is it all about? Love talking about the Carnegie Initiative. <laughs> I wonder who it's named after. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the Carnegie Initiative. <laughs> uh, I think my father would have been thrilled to know that I have gone full circle. He started the first hockey school in Canada in 1955, and it was not just about skills in hockey. It was about behavior and character. And here we are all these years later coming back to character and hockey and and how do we make our world a better place and it's not like hockey is the only sport that's having problems when you have when you have issues around racism and exclusion that happens everywhere in our life but you know we get these pockets of um, being profiled in the news and uh, of course, we have many other sports that are also being profiled for exactly the same thing, not being inclusive, whether it's about women or whether it's about um, abilities or whether it's about color, culture or race. Um, it plagues, it is, a, it is a pandemic in the world, unfortunately. And so the Carnegie Initiative was established, uh, the brainchild of Bryant McBride. Uh, everybody has to have a brain child <laughs> item. <laughs> Somebody has to think of it. And uh, he approached me and said, what do you think of this idea? What do you think of um, having your father as that model that we should emulate. And of course, I couldn't say no to that. And so we bring different organizations together to help them understand they're not in silos, that other people are trying to do the same thing they're doing. They may just be doing it differently, or they may have been, they may have taken a different approach. And every approach is a good approach because. It's there to help those in need in the communities where it is needed. And so it's not a competition. Life is a competition, of course. Getting a job is a competition. Getting on a team is a competition. Becoming a teacher is a competition. Whatever it is you choose in life, there is a competition because other people want those jobs too. But bringing Different organizations who are trying to make hockey better is not the competition. That is the let us get together. Let us talk about what worked for you. What are the successes that, have, that are making a difference that are helping your community do better? Because maybe I can transpose those, not steal those ideas, but transpose, borrow those ideas. Yeah. And bring them <laughs> and bring them into into my little circle because why do we have to keep recreating the wheel when there are things out there that are working? And so it has been so exciting to in the last couple of years we had our first summit in Boston 
We had our second summit in Toronto. And to see people talking together and feeling good about it, not angry with each other, but let me hear what you have. Let me see how I can adapt that and embrace it. So we're about bringing people together. Mm -hmm. A collective. And I was very aware how you gave Brian credit right off the hop there. Very, very, no steal in there, right? So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, I think the I heard the NHL was involved with this uh, as well. Is there, are they being going to be part of the uh, Carnegie Initiative? The NHL has participated. We're not we're not a branch of the NHL by any means, but the NHL sees the value in what we're doing. And I believe in one of the interviews that Kim Davis had after attending one of her summits, she said, what we're doing is revolutionary. <laughs> so we're yeah. trying to take the politics out. Um, we're trying to be above the politics and help to help to bring people together. Because as I said, everybody has a different way of approaching it. And not everybody's ideas are accepted, uh, but they're valued because um, there's a problem. And we need to resolve the problem. And that takes many people from many different walks of life to help us get there. Well, this is uh, wonderful. Uh, good luck with the initiative. And, and let me know. It you know, any way I can help out. So your dad was finally inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame last year. And uh, you and your brother Dale were involved in, in your dad's Hall of Fame induction speech. But let's have a look back at that. Quitting was never an option. He loved that game. He looked at me and looked in my direction because he was blind at the time. And he made this statement, Dale, if I had known the outcome in advance of my career, I would not have changed one minute. <laughs> he added, I was good at my craft. I knew the joy I gave crowds, their appreciation for my skills and the feeling and their feeling I will always cherish. He was the right man at the right time to be the leader so that others could have the opportunity to follow their goals and their dreams. Thank you. But I know my father is calling out to all of us to honor the sport he so loved by continuing to do it justice and like the new organization named after him, the Carnegie Initiative, we are responsible for making the sport better. We are responsible for ending sexism, gender bias, racism, and homophobia. We are responsible for making all areas of our lives more accepting and inclusive. This was my father's life work. This is what I learned from him. This is why I'm grateful every day that I get up and I go to sleep, knowing that he gave me part of his vision and that we can share that with others. So ladies and gentlemen, we the Carnegie family proudly accept this honor and recognition on behalf of our beloved family patriarch, Herb Carnegie. That 
that was beautiful. And I think that's a great way to sum it up, isn't it? Yeah. I'm tearing up <laughs> Think, thinking, well, about, thinking about it because I didn't believe it was going to happen. People have been working on it for years, trying to make it happen. And um, Bryant McBride and Burst have just put out a new documentary beyond their years that features my father and another gentleman by the name of Buck O'Neill, who was in baseball around the same time my father was, and how their lives parallel and, and, and some of the issues that they had to go through. I had no, I, you know, I'm just hmm. so grateful. I'm so grateful that the committee at the Hall of Fame finally saw who my father was. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that was difficult because he hadn't been in hockey for a long time. I'm the one who's been carrying that story forward for such a long time. And, um, but he deserves to be there. This makes his 14th Hall of Fame. And you don't get in that many Hall of Fames for doing nothing. <laughs> He gave himself to the world. And it wasn't just the sports. It was about who he was as a man. And so to be in the Hockey Hall of Fame for me is a final and fitting uh, space to finally come to. Because no one can take that away from him now. Um, it is an opportunity for people to go in and learn about the many men and women who have made it into the Hall of Fame and what was so special about them that will inspire all of us to be better individuals. So sport is sport, but sport is life. And we need to learn from all aspects of our lives. And hockey was clearly my father's first love. And now he really is in a fitting resting place. Beautiful. So well put. Uh, you know, you give our friend Kwame, David, uh, Kwame. Yes. Uh, uh, credit because uh, of, his, of his great documentary on your father. I think that's been helpful for a, for a lot of things as well as we've, as we've made headway. And you put it so well. You know, we are responsible. We are responsible. Every one of us, right? When we see it, spot it, call people on it, and don't be part of it. And I know when I, when I call people on it, when I've called people on it in the past, I know that I've always felt really good later on that I did, you know. So. And that is so important, Joe, because to not say anything in this day and age, then you're complicit. Mm -hmm. We're not, it's not that we're trying to make anybody feel guilty for the many, the 400 years of, of um, marginalized communities that have been here. But the fact of the matter is that when you know better, you need to do better. And I am so happy to be on this show with you because it is gentlemen like you, it's journalists like you who help us to, to become better by talking to the people that can share ideas in a different way. That's all we're doing. Sharing ideas, helping people see things just a little bit differently because I could have been you, or you could have been me. We have no control over who we're born to, or where we're born, or we have absolutely no control. So we could have been any, any, this is why it baffles me, why people actually have issues around who other people are. Because we could have easily been somewhere else, someone else, but different parents, different whatever. So, you know, let's not get too smug. 
about who we are and be grateful for what we're able to do. And you have a platform. Look at you. You have a platform for sharing stories that are going to help people do better in their lives. Congratulations to you. Bernice, I'm humbled. Thank you so much. It's been awesome having you on. Thank you for taking the time to join us for this extended version, two-parter. And uh, yeah, I, I do feel like I'm really blessed. And, and uh, you know, good luck with the Carnegie Initiative. And as I said, if you need anything at all, let me know. Okay. Well, listen, we need all the help we can get. <laughs> all hands so on you, deck. You want to keep sharing this story. And if we have partners, out, and you know, it's not even just we need help. It's something that, that uh, uh, Robin said. Do you want to be part of paying life forward and a movement that is going to make a difference? So if you are an individual or you are a corporation, you know, it's going to be my 78th birthday tomorrow. Send Happy $78. Birthday. Send $78 to, to the Carnegie Initiative as a gift. Done. <laughs> Done. Uh, that will be a lot of that'll be a lot of fun and hopefully a lot of people will say, yes, I want to be part of this movement. Great. Okay. Well, listen, thank you again. Bernice, this has been awesome. And uh, uh, it's just, I love the book. Oh, once again, the book is called A Fly in a Pail of Milk, the Herb Carnegie story, co-written by Herb and Bernice. And it's a great book. Go out and get it and uh, take some time to check out the Carnegie Initiative and see how you can be helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. It's been a pleasure. All right. We'll have more when we come back. What our kids breathe matters more than ever. But how can you tell if a school is safe to breathe in? If you could actually see what's in the air, would you keep them home? Introducing Air Patrol, making the invisible visible, ensuring schools are safer for everyone. Breathe safely. My Swiss pick of the week. Last week, I went with the number one horse, Ferret, in the opening race of Thursday night's card. Six furlongs in the Woodbine Tapita. The favorite, Silent Ghost, gave up the lead in the final turn. Ferret got into a duel with Airy Ferry, and Airy Ferry got up for the win at 14-1 to 1 with Amanda Vandermeesh aboard, trained by Allison Crook. I did have Ferret to place, so I got my money back. My pick of the week? Well, we've got a big one coming up at Woodbine. This is huge. The $1 million Rico Woodbine Mile is coming up Saturday. This is one of the premier turf events in the world. A win, and you're in for the Breeders' Cup. And I'm going to take a horse that's being shipped over from England, Master of the Seas from Godolphin Stables. Master of the Seas coming off an impressive win in the Group 2 Fred Cowley Memorial Mile on July 15th. The Charles Appleby trainee has six wins in 13 career starts. Go to woodbine.com for all the latest, uh, latest racing info. You can also get the latest from Woodbine Thoroughbred and Woodbine Standard Bread on Instagram and X. And go to hpibet.com, darkhorsebets.com, and bet365 for your wagering options. Discover the finest patio experience in Toronto at the Stella Ortois Terrace. Situated on the third floor of Woodbine Racetrack, delight in mouth-watering shared appetizer and raise a toast to the evening. Relish expertly prepared main courses that will tantalize your taste buds. Capture the beauty of sunsets. Indulge in delectable desserts. Secure your reservation today and immerse yourself in the excitement of the races. Enjoy an unparalleled view of the thrilling finish line. Well, it's a special place and uh, the food is great, the atmosphere, it's, uh, it's really a, a, a nice experience. Experience the enchantment of Stella Ortois Terrace. Open four days a week. Undoubtedly the city's premier patio destination. Addiction Rehab Toronto, Toronto's number one alcohol and drug treatment center, saving lives, 
reuniting families. The only treatment center in the province to offer medical detox, treatment, sober living, and lifetime aftercare all in one place. Our unique and specialized programs are designed to equip our clients with the tools to successfully lead a life of dignity, respect, and purpose. Let us help save your life or your loved one's life. Call today for more information or to facilitate an intervention. 1-855-787-2424 or visit addictionrehabtoronto.ca. Attention security seekers, ready to take control? Introducing Corporate Protection and Investigative Services, your ultimate solution. Retailers tired of losing profits to theft? Our retail loss prevention experts have you covered. Mobile patrol, close body protection, insured door persons, we've got your security needs covered from all angles. Background investigations and civil recovery programs, trust us for thorough solutions. Licensed by the Ministry of Solicitor General, fully insured and bonded. Visit www.corporateprotection.ca or call 1-800-827-1692 for top-notch security and private investigation services. MNP, a leading Canadian national accounting, tax, and business accounting firm. MNP proudly serves and responds to the need of their clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. Through partner-led engagements, MNP provides a collaborative, cost-effective approach to do business and personal strategies to help people and organizations to succeed across the country and around the world. With local offices in Oshawa, Mississauga, Burlington, and more, their team is here to support you. Visit mnp.ca today to learn more. And we want to thank all the folks who make this show possible. These are friends, trusted business associates, and all-around great folks. We highly recommend them all. Thank you for your support of Canadian and local sports. A reminder that the show is available on iTunes, Spotify, Breaker, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, Pocket Cast, as well as the Spanglish Network, Zingo TV, and Buzz TV Live. Also, check out the show on YouTube. All of our past great shows are there, some clips and shorts. Like and subscribe. It's absolutely free. You can spend hours there. There's so much fun stuff to see. Thanks once again to Bernice Carnegie for being on the program. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Brian Gribben Insurance Planning, helping you solidify your financial future. At BGIP, what we do that's unique in the marketplace is we show people how to spend and enjoy their money in their early years of retirement without the fear of running out. Also, we're able to do this without you having to change financial advisors. Please look us up at bgip.ca today. Let's book a 30-minute phone call to see how we can bring value to you and your family and your planning. Call Brian today for all your retirement needs. We did. 905-686-5678. Do you want to buy or sell a home? Could 31 years of real estate experience help you? Why not speak to an amazing team that loves to overpromise and overdeliver? Aldo has a tremendous team of experts on staff. They are committed to making your next real estate transaction smooth and comfortable. Call 416 Get Aldo or visit getaldo.com. Air quality at work matters more than ever, but there's no way to tell if a space is safe to breathe in. If you could actually see what's in the air, would you even come to work? Introducing Air Patrol, making the invisible visible, ensuring workplaces are safer for everyone. Breathe safely. Rooted in 60 years of tradition, Sleepy Hollow is a private golf club with a friendly community of members just minutes from Toronto. With mature trees and rolling fairways, Sleepy Hollow provides a challenging and enjoyable experience for passionate golfers. Enjoy great golf, amazing dining, and a picturesque patio second to none. Visit SleepyHollowCountryClub.com. Joe Tilly here. My wife Penny Claire and I recently took an amazing trip to Egypt and Jordan with Trip Up Hope. And here are our top 10 must-dos. Number six, the mighty temple of Abu Simbel was also a highlight. As I stood before the colossal statues of the temple of Abu Simbel, 
I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe and wonder at the sheer scale and beauty of this ancient monument. I would highly recommend that you book your next trip through Tripopple. Call them today. Hi there, I'm Joe Tilly. Are you ready for an adventure of a lifetime? Next March, during the enchanting cherry blossom season, join me and my wife for an unforgettable two-week journey to Japan and South Korea. In Japan, you'll experience the magic of the season as we visit the stunning Osaka Castle against the backdrop of cherry blossoms. Feed the adorable Sika deer at Nara Park, glide through picturesque landscapes on the famed bullet train, cruise on Lake Kawaguchi and witness the awe-inspiring view of Mount Fuji. Relax in natural hot springs and savor a delightful Fuji dinner banquet while dressing in traditional robes. And of course, we'll dive into Tokyo's cutting-edge technology scene. In Korea, dress in elegant hanbok attire and step back in time at Changdok Gong Palace. Wander through Andong Village, a true glimpse into Korea's rich heritage. Delight your taste buds with the flavors of Korean barbecue. We'll even visit the DMZ area to get a glimpse of mysterious North Korea. And guess what? This incredible journey is all yours for just $54.99, all inclusive with direct flights from Vancouver or $58.99 from Toronto. Book now to unlock up to an extra $1,700 in upgrades and savings. Let's make some memories. Let's explore. Let's travel. Guests on Joe Tilly Sports receive a gift certificate from Classica Imports. Top of the line, imported men's clothing. Check out the Classica Essential Collection now. Go to shopclassica.com.